to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. We're just going to pick right up where we left off, and now we'll go into Romans chapter 2, verse 1, and we're going to take the second segment of humanity that God is building his case against, and we're going to slip away from the grossly immoral segment to the moral people, and they're just as guilty. Again, we like to welcome our television audience, and we're doing this routinely for a few programs. Uh, Keith thought that uh, we weren't making enough of the videos and the booklets, so he was good enough to set up a little display that the camera can pan in on. And so we want our television audience to be aware that all of our past programs, lessons, whatever you want to call them, have been made available now on videotapes and also in the printed, in the little booklet. Someday, Lord tarries and I get retired and have the time, we may take all the material from these booklets and put it into a hardcover and make it an authored book where I can literally <coughs> make the corrections that I think should be made and uh, make it a little easier reading. But until then, these little books are filling a niche and uh, we know a lot of folk are enjoying them. So if you're interested at all, give us a call on the 800 number. Try to catch us between 8 in the morning and noon because Iris works full time and of course I'm a full time rancher. I'm not around the phone all that much. I refuse to put in a recorder because I hate them when I call somebody. So I just tell everybody out on television, if you don't get us once, try again. And if you try in the forenoon, one or other of us will answer the phone. And you know, it's amusing. I answer the phone and people are shocked. And they say, you know, I'm talking to Les. And I, well, of course. I said, I'm not beyond answering my own phone. Uh, oh, we thought we had a huge staff to do that. No, I said, the only staff I got is my other half. And uh, I pick up the rest of them. So you feel free to call us or write to us. <clears throat> and we'll get these to you. All right. Now, those of you here in the studio audience, as well as those of you who follow with us verse by verse, let's go to Romans chapter 2. And we're going to deal now with the moral man. Oh, he wouldn't dream of living like those people do. Oh, Wendy, verse 1, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that what? Judgeth. See that? That's why I said in that first hour or, or last program we were going through, I won't look down my nose at these people. I feel that they are grossly in error, but I'm not judging them, because but for the grace of God, there go I, and that's what I've been telling my class people, if it weren't for the grace of God, you'd be where they are, because you see, every one of us have the potential for all of this, because we're out of Adam. We're all out of Adam, and it's only the grace of God naturally under some parental teaching, parental inhibitions, which of course a lot of our young people today are not getting, but nevertheless the potential is there in every human being to go to the same depths. Now he says, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, you what? You condemn yourself. Now the other nasty word for this is Hypocrite, isn't it? Hypocrite. Oh, that's what the hypocrite loves to do. He likes to point the finger at the other fella, but he forgets that when he points two or three that way, one or two of them are pointing back. And so every one of us have to be aware of the fact that if we're going to start judging someone, we better look here first. Amen. For thou that judgest doest what? Same, Same things. Oh, we wouldn't dream of doing it. Oh, maybe not overtly, but what about covertly? Or what about in the thinking processes, see? Oh, my land. I think any one of us would hate to admit what we sometimes run through our mind. Every one of you. Don't tell me you don't, because then you're not a member of the human race. Because it's there. And I've always told people, well, you know what these little kids hear, that won't register. Oh, no. It goes into that subconscious, and it just lays there until just the right time, and then, boom, it comes up into the conscience, and they remember it. All right? 
Verse 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them who commit such things, even if it's only covertly. And thinkest thou this, O man, thou that judgest them who do such thing and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? You see that? Even the good person who wouldn't dream of entering into a homosexual relationship, oh, he wouldn't dream of it. But mentally, in his thought processes, he's just as guilty. Now, you remember what Jesus did with the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery? Boy, he took it so far that none of us are clear of it. Even if you think it in your heart, you're just as guilty as the person that does it. Now, that's hard for us to comprehend, but that's what the book said. That's what Jesus said. And so you move on through all the way through these verses, and it's dealing with this moral person who says, oh, I wouldn't dream of doing those things. And in the same breath, he condemns those that do, but God is going to judge him just as much. All right, verse, oh, let's see, I'm going to skip some of these. I'd like to get as far into chapter 3 as possible in this program. But verse 6, no, verse 5, let's go back to verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath. See, there's that word again. It has never happened yet, but it's coming. The wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them who are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey or live in unrighteousness, What's their future? The indignation of God and his what again? Wrath. Now remember, God has never yet poured out his wrath. That's something that is still future, but oh, when it comes, it's going to be beyond human comprehension. Well, come all the way down to verse 11. There is no respect of persons with God. In other words, God is not going to treat an American better than a Japanese. He's not going to treat a German better than a Russian. He's not going to treat a white person better than a black person. With God, there is no difference. There is no respecting of persons. We're all sons of Adam. Verse 12, for as many as have sinned without law, in other words, outside the realm of Judaism, they shall perish without law. In other words, it's not going to excuse them just because they weren't under the Mosaic system. And as many as have sinned in the law, now, of course, we're right into the very middle of the children of Israel, those who have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Well, we know what the law does. We'll see that in the next chapter. It condemns everybody because every human being that's ever lived other than Christ himself has already broken the law, and so they're condemned. All right, verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just or justified before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now we have to be careful. That's under the law. Go all the way back to Deuteronomy. No, Exodus. Let's go back to Exodus. There's one in Deuteronomy too, but I think the one in Exodus is plainer. Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Exodus 19 and come down to verse 7. Here the children of Israel had just recently been brought out of Egypt. They're all encamped around Mount Sinai. Moses has gone up into Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments and the law from the Lord himself. Now he's come back down from the mountain, verse 7, And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. Now he's going to refer it to the children of Israel. And all the people, that is of Israel, answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will what? Do. See? Now that's legalism. That's law. 
and whatever the law commanded Israel says, we'll do it. Well, if it was done prompted by faith, that's what God wanted. But nevertheless, remember that law demanded doing on the part of its adherents. It had to be prompted by faith, of course. But they still had to do what God said to do. Now I'll come back then to Romans chapter 2, and this is what Paul is talking about. That when the Jew was under the law, he couldn't get by with faith plus nothing. He had to have faith plus doing something, whatever the law demanded. So I had to clear that up. Verse 14, for when the Gentiles who have not the law. Now keep that in your computer because in our next program, I hope, maybe this one, but I think it'll be the next one. We'll get into Romans chapter 3. And Paul is going to lay it out as plain as day of what the law does and what it does not do. All right, so the Gentiles who have not the law do by nature or naturally the things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law to themselves. Now I have to read verse 15. <clears throat> Which shows the work of the law written where? In their heart. Their What's the next word? Conscience. Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts. See that? Remember what I just said? They may not be guilty of it overtly, but they're going to be guilty of it covertly, especially in the thought processes. Their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or, oh, there's the next word, excusing. That's human nature. Now, where does it all begin? The conscience. When God created Adam, what did he put in his breast, as it were? Conscience. And conscience was to precipitate confession. And that, of course, is what prompted Abel to bring the required sacrifice. His conscience convicted him, and he listened to it. But you see, it's within the realm of human nature to spurn conscience. I mean, we can burn it, and we can get it to the place where it just is no longer active. And of course, that's what so many people have to do. But it's there, and you can't, you can't ignore it. All right, then verse 16, an amazing verse. In the day when God shall judge the secrets, that is, the secret activities of these moral people, as well as the open activity of the immoral. But there's coming a day when God will judge these things by Jesus Christ according to what? My gospel. Now, what's Paul's gospel again? That Christ died for all these sins. He died for the sins of every homosexual that has ever lived. He's died for the sins of these moral hypocrites. He's died for the sins of these religious people that we're going to see in the next series of verses. And consequently, God is going to judge the human race based upon that. You wouldn't have to go where you're going because Christ has already settled your account if you would have just believed it, see? And so they will be. You know, that just reminds me, uh, I have a tape at home, and I don't remember who is on it, but the name of the tape is uh, Our American Heritage or Our Godly American Heritage, I think is it. And he expresses in that tape, and he reads from Supreme Court opinions of our early days of our nation, where those Supreme Court judges, in their opinions, quoted this book. Quoted this book in their opinion. Can you imagine that happening today? And in another place, he points out how that our top government officials, presidents, and top cabinet people maintain that America could not survive, and it didn't just say the Bible. They said, unless America remains true to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I couldn't hardly believe that when I saw that. I could understand that men like Washington and some of those would say, we have to stand on this book. But many of them even narrowed it down that it has to be based upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, I read something just the other day. I think it was by Jefferson, 
And Jefferson, of course, was not what I would call a, a born-again believer. I think Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin both were rather more or less the same bold of cloth. But Jefferson still came back and said, unless this nation stands and operates under the Word of God, it is doomed to fall. And we're seeing it happen Amen. right before our eyes. All right, now then. We'll come on down to verse 17, and we're going to see the prosecuting attorney now move to the third segment of humanity, and that's the religious person. Now, you know I have no time for the word religion, don't you, by now. I think it's the most awful term in the human language. Religion prompts hatred. Religion precipitates war. Religion takes people down the dark path of legalism. Religion is always man's attempt to somehow please God. Christianity is never a religion. Christianity is God reaching down in mercy and grace to a lost human race. Religion never does that. Paul used it in a bad light when he says that he was saved out of the Jews' religion. Because that's what he was. He was religious. But what was he? He hated the very name of Jesus of Nazareth as a religious person. All right, now, in these succeeding verses, this is what we're dealing with. A religious Jew, in fact, because that, of course, was the primary religion that Paul had to deal with. And so, verse 17, he says, Behold, thou art called a Jew. You rest in the law. Make us thy boast of God. Now, most of you have spent enough time in your Sunday school material about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and what have you. You know how they were. Oh, they were self-righteous. They were proud of their religious status. All right, this is what Paul is now addressing. Verse 18, you know his will and approve us the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, the Mosaic law. So they should have known and are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, who has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. In other words, those Pharisees, those religious leaders of Israel, they had all that kind of knowledge. And then look at verse 21. Thou therefore who teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? That thou preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Oh, hey, what were the priests of Israel known for many times? Stealing from widows and the disenchanted, the underprivileged. You bet they did. Oh, why do you suppose Jesus went through and overturned the tables of the money changers? Because it wasn't even legitimate business. They were charging 10 prices for necessary sacrificial animals that the poor people couldn't go out someplace and barter for and buy. And so they had to buy it at the temple. And they took advantage of them. Charged them probably 10 times more than they would have had to. And that's why Jesus got so angry and turned over the bunny tables and went. Well, Paul's alluding to the same thing. Oh, these self-righteous Pharisees, these religious leaders, they had pomp, they were self-righteous, but underneath they'd do anything they could get away with. All right, read on. Verse 22, thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Well, man, all you have to do is go back to the Old Testament. What was the behavior of many of those priests? Hey, they were awful. The sons of Eli, even the people of Israel knew it. They said, they're not godly like you are. And here again, Paul is referring back to those situations. Verse 23, thou that makest the boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God, for the name of God is blasphemed. Now, this is tough language. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth if you keep the law. In other words, absolutely it was profitable to be a Jew. They had the Word of God, as we're going to see in chapter 3, verse 1 in just a moment. But oh, they ignored all that. 
they ignored their exalted position. Verse 27, And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? In other words, Paul is saying, you bring me a saved Gentile, and he'll make you blush with shame. See? Verse 28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Now we're speaking in the spiritual realm. And circumcision is that of the heart. I'm sorry, verse 28. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but the true spiritual person, and here Paul is calling him a Jew, a true spiritual person is one inwardly. And circumcision that really counts with God is not of the flesh, it's of the heart. That's spiritual circumcision. And you remember what I've always told you circumcision does? It cuts off that which is superfluous in the flesh. So what is superfluous in the spirit? The old Adam. And so at salvation, our old Adam is cut off, and it becomes a heart circumcision. All right? And it's that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, keeping the law, whose praise is not of men, but of God. All right, now let's move in quickly in these closing minutes to chapter 3. This is the final condemnation. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision, or being an adherent of Judaism? Well, his answer is much. Every way. Oh, they had so much going for them. They had all the covenant promises. They had the Old Testament. They had the prophets. They had the Psalms. They had the temple. They had the priesthood. That was all going for them. But Paul says that still wasn't the most important. The most important was they had the oracles of God. Now, I always make the point, even when we go into the book of Acts, that Luke was not a Gentile. I'm convinced he had to be a Jew. If he wasn't a full Jew, he was at least a half of one, because the Scripture makes a point of the fact that only Jews wrote this book by inspiration of the Spirit. So much every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. All right, now then I'd like to have you come all the way down to verse 5. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? Is God going to be unfair when he will one day pour out his wrath on Christ-rejecting men? No. Because, you see, he's paid, as I said in the program, I think, in our last taping. Every human being that's ever lived had his sin debt paid in full at the cross. Everybody. Every person that's ever lived has already, so far as God concerned, had reconciliation accomplished. And all they have to do is believe it, to appropriate it. And so this is why God will have every right in the world to pour out his wrath. He's done everything possible to make it as simple as possible so that lost humanity can come back to himself. All right, so then, verse 6, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? He's going to have every right in the world to. Now, verse 7, For if the truth of God had more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? Even though he was a religious man, he was a religious zealot of Judaism, and yet God had to even tell Saul of Tarsus that he was a sinner. He was undone. And then verse 8, And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm or claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just, he said, those who say that. You remember, again, going back several weeks, I told you I just read a little commentary on, I think it was just on Romans chapter 6, by a British theologian of a bygone day. And he made the claim that if we do not teach and proclaim the gospel of grace as this book intends it to be taught, then we are going to be accused by some 
just like Paul says here that he was slanderously accused, they're going to tell us, if that's the way it is, then you're telling me I can live as ungodly as I want so that I can check out the grace of God. No, that's not what it means. It just simply means that no matter how deep a sinner goes, God's grace is always greater. And that's never licensed to see how far we can go. All right. Now then, here's where I want to at least end up the program. The final verdict. The prosecuting attorney has laid out all of his reasons. He has categorized the human race into these three areas. Now look what the scripture says. Verse 9, what then? Are we Jews better than they, Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jew and Gentile, they are, what's the next word? All under sin. There is none righteous, there is none that seeketh after God. You see that? That is the final verdict. Now, to carry it a little bit further, I'm going to skip a few verses and we'll pick it up again in the next program. You come on over to verse 22 and 23 of this same chapter, Romans 3, and here we'll end. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe... Jew and Gentile, black and white, rich or poor, and then what's the next statement? There is no difference. There is no difference. And oh, that flies in the face of so many people. But you see, I used the expression last night, that verse makes a level playing field. Nobody can say, well, I'm at a better advantage. Nobody can say, well, I'm at a lesser advantage because the scripture says there is no difference. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry 